Okay, let me not, uh, <coughs> excuse me, let me not leave you there, just waiting to see what happens. We'll, we'll, we'll kick off and people will come in as and when they uh, they, they arrive. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give a really short-ish introduction and just to welcome everybody else who's here uh, to our, um, our annual Huxley, June Huxley lecture. I'm, I meant to look up which number it was, but but that seems to be lost in the mist of time. So I can't really, really work out what it is, but it's another Julian Huxley lecture of the Systematic Association. I'm really pleased, in fact, to be able to introduce uh, um, Susan, Susan Perkins. Um, uh, there's a, a bunch of little notes I put down here and I've put something about the um, coming on the umbrella of COVID casualties because we were obviously arranging this for last year and another aspect of that casualty would be it would have been lovely to have this in the uh the Nan society rooms in piccadilly so uh i guess what i'm going to say to you is we, we we probably owe one doing it at such a distance so at some time we'll we'll get get you to london and we'll get you to the to the Linnaean. um uh i I should give you a little bit of background about Sue. And she, she's got this on her first slide, so I, I'm just going to repeat some of the things she's already got. There. At the moment, she is the Martin and Michelle Cohen Dean of Science at the City College of New York. But prior to that, she was a she, she curator and professor at the American Museum of Natural History. And as I might note here, Tony, she's program director at the National Science Foundation for the Division of Environmental Biology and a professor at the Richard Gilder. Graduate School American Museum of Natural History. So it's a, a, a very impressive list of uh, um, occupations, if, if, if you like, and a nice closeness between um, uh, the university and the, the museum, which is a, a, a nice way of developing things. Um, I was going to say something about the, the, the output or whatever we're supposed to call it now. I didn't bother trying to count up your publications there's a lot of them that they're, they're they're impressive we we spoke a little bit about the book you did with rob how welcome to the microbiome getting to know the trillions of bacteria and other microbes in on and around you and i get up my notes here to tell me that uh, it is a great book um should try and get one once this is over. yeah some of you should try and get get one of these when this is over um uh the other thing i should note that susan has done um a few interesting uh, book reviews. Um, my own introduction to her work was some while ago, and it was in a, a book that's um, difficult to get a hold of now, Red Page's book, uh, Tangled Trees, Phylogeny, Co-Speciation, Evolution. I don't know, one of these things is a, it's a fantastic book. I don't know why it's not uh, um, available more. It's certainly worth getting. I think there's a lot of really interesting things were putting that book which the title uh for your or your contribution there was lizards malaria and jungles in the caribbean which is such a, a few things i've noted here one that's a lovely title and second uh, it's a sort of question but you don't have to answer it now does that mean you're the person responsible for all these tangled trees we've got now um perhaps it's so anyway i'm not going to say any more than that uh i i think you'll probably cover all these things in your talk, which uh, is, um, let me give you the title and then you can take it away. It's Malaria's Many Mates, Challenges and Opportunities on, of Hemosporidian Systematics. Susan, it's uh, all yours if this screen comes up. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, David. And, and like you said, uh, this has been a couple years in the making. We had hoped it would happen last year, COVID got in the way. And then this year was a go, except we were hoping to do it in person. I am going to take you up on that, uh, take a rain check, and I definitely want to come spend some time uh, in the UK. I've spent no time at all in London, and I really look forward to visiting, meeting everybody in person. Um, thanks to everybody who, who came today from seeing friends from all over the, the globe here. Um, and for folks that might be watching this later on video, uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen and get started. Um, all right. So as David said, uh, the talk today is gonna be about my work. I, I guess I added up, it's the last 26 years of my career struggling 
honestly struggling with one of the more challenging groups of organisms on the planet. And you'll, you'll see uh, reasons for those struggles soon. But I think at the end of the day, there's been some, some really good progress, some foundations at least laid. I hope that this work uh, will continue on through my own students and others in the field, um, as well as, as others who follow behind. So the outline of the talk today, I'm gonna start off by, I hope impressing you with just how diverse uh, the clade of malaria parasites, the Hemosporidians are, uh, and diverse in many interesting ways. I'll then talk a little bit about the challenges that have been plaguing uh, systematic biologists for, for more than a century of how to do taxonomy of these parasites, how to delimit species, how to, how to do higher level classification. The bulk of the talk will be more of the, the true systematics, since this is the Systematics Association um, Huxley Lecture, uh, and explain basically the evolution of how we have developed phylogenetic methods to study this group and some of the interesting uh, things that have come out of that. And then I'll finish up with some more recent work where we're using genomic tools to start to I guess, dive under the hood of these parasites and use that diversity, which we'll start with, uh, to our advantage to look at how really important traits in these important parasites might have evolved. Okay, so let's kick it off with the background on the diversity. I, I know everyone listening to this knows that malaria is still a very major disease around the globe. Uh, it primarily infects children in sub-Saharan Africa, that is, that is by far the largest target group, uh, and most of the deaths due to malaria are caused by the species Plasmodium falciparum. Of course, we see uh, human malaria, at least, around many of the tropical, subtropical regions of the world, and I think David was tweeting this earlier, this is an opportune time because, of course, just last week, one of the first effective vaccines was announced. This is a vaccination that is meant to protect children uh, and will be given around Africa. As I, as I said, this is the, the primary group that suffers the major mortality from this disease. So this is really important news uh, in terms of the, the global efforts to fight this disease. We now know, or we should, I should say, we consider five different species of plasmodium that commonly infect humans in different parts of the world. As I said, Plasmodium falciparum is the main culprit when we're talking about deaths. Uh, but in terms of other hosts, even just within Plasmodium, there are more than 200 described species. And I have to confess, I haven't updated this slide in a while. There have been more species described um, in the intervening decade or so. But just within mammals, we see quite a lot of diversity in non-human primates rodents, bats, and then other um, mammals such as ungulates, a few insectivores, and there's even a species of plasmodium that was described infecting the pangolin. So who knows if that's still around uh, given the conservation status of, of pangolins, but there was one described there. There are several dozen species of plasmodium that have been formally described in birds, uh, although I should say we now have evidence of hundreds and hundreds of independent lineages uh, from birds that have mainly been introduced to our knowledge through DNA barcoding. And then probably now over 100 different species of plasmodium infecting squamate reptiles, such as lizards and snakes. And I've had the great fortune, I will say, of spending a lot of my career looking at plasmodium and lizards. It's a really fascinating um, group of parasites. They are found all over the world, including at, at high and low latitudes, uh, Wyoming and New York, down in New Zealand, and infecting over 10 different family of, of lizard hosts. So a lot of diversity just in these squamate hosts. That's just plasmodium. If we back out and look at hemosporidians, we have at least 600 species that have been placed into approximately 15 different genera. So a very large genus known as Hemoproteus that primarily is found in birds um, and another bird exclusive genus, Leucocytozoan, where we've seen a lot of diversity. If we zoom in on what I like to call the more minor genera, so these are, are not as species rich, 
uh, we see an interesting um, pattern here, which is that bats, which I've depicted in purple in this graph, are quite diverse uh, in terms of hosts. So we have multiple different genera that have been described from bat hosts, and we also have a few other uh, monotypic genera from bats, crocodilians, and even a putative one from a fish, mesnilium. All of the parasites within this group follow the same basic life cycle in that they alternate between a vertebrate host, which is truly the intermediate host, if we're gonna be proper parasitologists, and the definitive host, the insect vector, which is always a dipteran blood feeding insect. Um, although it's not always a mosquito if we're talking about some of these other genera. I wanted to zoom in on the vertebrate part of this and just mention a couple of things. So, Traditionally, parasites classified as plasmodium must uh, exhibit asexual replication, a process we call schizogony, in blood cells. Many of the other genera do not replicate in blood cells, and instead that asexual replication only happens in other tissues in the body. So that could be the liver, the spleen, uh, other organs. All of these parasites, though, then express gametocytes, the sexual stages, into vertebrate blood cells where they await being uh, picked up by that next blood feeding dipteran vector. Another key component that's been widely used throughout classification is hemozoan pigment. So this is a crystalline structure that the parasite makes as it digests host hemoglobin. And we're going to bookmark that. I'm going to ask you to, to file that away. We're going to come back to that at the end of the talk um, and look at that. But here we see a nicely colorized version. You can, you can explicitly see this crystalline structure of hemozoan pigment in a mammalian cell. Here's a bird parasite, and you can see these nuggets, we often call them, in that cell. But it's not universal. So this next picture is of a leukocytozoan parasite. We don't see any hemozoan pigment uh, in those cells. So that brings us to the taxonomy. How do we use some of these key elements, key characters uh, to classify? So Percy Garnum, uh, arguably sort of the godfather of malaria diversity, uh, wrote his tome back in 1966. And at that point created three different families within hemosporidians. Uh, and based that based on whether they use mosquitoes or not, that trait of schizogony in the blood, which is only in plasmodium, whether we see that malarial pigment, and then also where the mature uh, or the gametocytes, what types of blood cells the gametocytes are found in. A couple decades later, Levine and his uh, classification of all the AP complexins basically made a two-way dichotomous key using these traits. So the schizogony in blood cells and the hemozoan pigment. And using these combinations, he erected uh, four different families, Plasmodiidae, Garniidae, a very large family, Hemoproteidae, and then the Leucocytozoidae. So you've seen Leucocytozoan, a bird parasite. By this point in time, there was a similar parasite that had been observed in lizards known as Sauricytozoan. Now, I wanted to, to appeal, I know a lot of, of systematists are very fortunate. You have interesting organisms with morphologies. There are keys, there are things you can look at to tell species apart. Um, I chose two of your British uh, backyard birds here. I'm very envious of that because what I have is a blob on a microscope slide. And so in terms of morphology, there really aren't a lot of characters that we can use. Historically, sometimes folks had measured the dimensions of the parasite cells, such as the length, the width, the area, or in the sky zone, which is the asexually dividing parasite, we can count up the number of daughter cells, the merozoites, and use that as a trait. However, as my old PhD advisor used to like to say, looking at morphology of a stained parasite on a smear is a bit like doing insect taxonomy with the bugs that are smashed on your windscreen. It's not exactly their living trait. Nonetheless, these have been used, but there've been problems. And let me illustrate that here with this graph. So here we have a malarial parasite in lizards, Plasmodium floridense. And in red, we see the number of, of merozoites yeah, per skyzont 
um, that were observed across Scoloporus host, and in yellow, the same trait in Anolis host. And right away, you can see that there's variation both within hosts, but also between these two host groups where the mean is higher in the Anolis host. So it's not a diagnostic character by any stretch. And furthermore, these characters can have significant overlap. So here we're looking at something similar, although with the length by width of the Skyzon um, cell. So here's Plasmodium floridensi again in three different Anolis hosts. We see a wide range of that, of that morphometric trait, if you will, but there's overlap. So we couldn't necessarily use the size uh, of these parasites in any diagnostic way. And so this has been really troublesome um, throughout the descriptions of, of these parasites. There are some other slight characters that have been used, but typically it's, it's fallen back to host geography uh, and other sort of non-inherent qualities, non-inherent traits for these organisms. Okay, what we've wanted then, what we really are seeking out is to understand the evolutionary history of these parasites. Um, and I wanna then spend the bulk of the talk explaining a little bit about the challenges that we've been dealing with really for decades and decades. So this is the first and, and pretty much only phylogeny of hemispheridians and their, their earlier relatives that I can find. And of course, this is not a cladistic tree by any stretch. Um, and it has interesting quality to it, which is each of the major branches that you're looking at reflect the vertebrate host. So we have the reptile parasites on the left, the birds in the center, and mammals on the right. And they culminate in Plasmodium as you know, the most derived, if you will, group of all of these parasites found in each of these lineages. So uh, already, you know, shaking up uh, any kind of cladistic notions of, of phylogenetic trees. So I've already talked in the taxonomy portion that in terms of systematics, we really don't have much of morphology and it's often not informative or might be plastic. And so like, every other organism on the planet, the systematists for malaria have turned to molecular markers. The first one, of course, as, as we've seen in, in other groups of organisms, is ribosomal DNA, ribosomal RNA genes. Uh, these were widely used, of course, as molecular systematics was kicking off uh, back in the late 80s and 90s, and these genes were sequenced from a handful of plasmodium parasites. So this is the first molecular phylogeny that came out by Andy Waters and his colleagues, and it really had a surprising conclusion, and that was this virulent parasite, Plasmodium falciparum, was sister to two bird parasites, Plasmodium gallinaceum and La Fure. And so their conclusion in the title of their paper was that when we domesticated chickens, that their avian malaria parasites jumped into humans, and they explained that the virulence of human malaria uh, in, in Plasmodium falciparum was because of this novelty, this recent invasion of hosts. But of course, of course, there's many systematists in the audience and you can already see some of the problems with this conclusion. Uh, Mark Siddall and John Barda uh, pointed this out the following year, primarily that the tree was rooted with a different phylum. So acanthamoeba, incredibly distantly related, very hard to polarize any kind of characters. But much more fundamentally, of course, is that this, this trait was optimized incorrectly. Um, in pink are the human malarial parasites and then Plasmodium burgii in rodents. And of course, what they should have concluded based on these limited data was that we gave malaria to birds, not the other way around. Um, but of course, no one truly believes that we have avian malaria spread all over the globe, and it seems improbable that that would have happened and the diversification uh, could have occurred in just the 4,000 or so years uh, that we've been uh, domesticating chickens. There was, however, a much more fundamental problem of, of these relationships, and that's just one of the genetic oddities of, of hemosporidians. And that is, if we look at typical eukaryotes, be they yeast, Drosophila, or chicken, Huxley himself, uh, all of our typical eukaryotes have 100 to 200 or so-ish uh, ribosomal DNA units tandemly repeated in the genome. Plasmonium and its relatives, that is not the case. We have just a handful of ribosomal loci, four to eight maybe in the bird malaria parasite, and these loci can be found on different chromosomes. So there are four, lo four loci in rodent malaria, 
even between these closely related species, Shibodi and Bergii, those loci exist on different chromosomes. And then adding on to that, these different loci are actually expressed during different parts of the parasite life cycle. And so we have what's called type A in the asexual phase, S in the sporozoite um, and vector phase, and even in some parasites, a third type that's only in the oak, um, oak knee. And so there's different selection pressures depending on the part of the parasite life cycle. And so these different loci can differ by more than 10%, even within a single species. Okay, so ribosomal DNA loci are out. They are not, they're not useful. They're very challenging to work with. And so what was the next most common uh, set of markers that systematists were using was mitochondrial genes. Once again, hemosporidians are very bizarre and they have one of the most uh, highly reduced mitochondrial genomes of any organism that still has one. So if we're talking about typical animal, this is a human mitochondrial genome. We've got 37 genes, usually 13 protein coding genes, about 16,000 base pairs in a circular structure. Hemosporidians have linear mitochondrial genomes. They contain only three protein coding genes and fragmented ribosomal genes. But these linear small genomes themselves are then tandemly repeated a uh, hundred times or more within the mitochondria. So we have less to work with, but nonetheless, one of the things that I did starting back as when I was a PhD student was to begin to sequence cytochrome B uh, from a variety of parasites. And so that first phylogeny came out soon after I, I finished my PhD, uh, along with Joe Shaw. And what we found were a couple of interesting uh, patterns. So if you look at this phylogeny, we rooted with another AP complexin, um, a pyroplasm, and we essentially see two major clades. And I'm gonna zoom in on each of them. So the mammalian clade uh, does contain plasmodium falciparum. So this refutes the idea that we got it when we domesticated chickens. The sister taxon was plasmodium reichenaui, which is a parasite found in chimpanzees. But we were surprised to see hepatocystis, which had been described as a completely separate genus using a different vector and having different life history right there within the mammalian uh, plasmodium clade. On the other side of the phylogeny, we see bird and lizard parasites. So lizards in green, birds in blue. Looks like there has been some host switching back and forth. Clearly there is a taxonomic issue with hemoproteus. It's polyphyletic in our phylogeny here. Um, with some other issues as well, as you could see a mixture of other genera. So, you know, I'm following the trajectory of other folks who are working in molecular systematics. And so the next phase of this process, of course, comes looking for nuclear genes, particularly single copy nuclear genes uh, that we can use to, to add characters. Plasmodium and hemosporidians have incredibly high AT content. And so it was always a struggle to try to design primers um, that had any reasonable melting temperature. And the available genomes that were around from the mid 90s on included just the human parasites and the rodent malaria models. And so these bird and lizard parasites were fairly distantly related. And so primer set after primer set just did not work consistently. However, soon after I left the, the lab at University of Vermont with Joe, another grad student, Ellen Martinson, came along and she began to have a little bit of success. And so combined, we took cytochrome before, as well as another mitochondrial from the parasite's plastid genome, CLP, and then one was able to get a very tiny nuclear fragment, uh, ASL, uh, to work from the nuclear genome. So we combined these four markers and got a really nice, robust uh, phylogeny that was similar to the, the previous one. And of course, we're starting to see some consistent patterns here. So birds do appear to be the original host of these parasites. And in fact, Given the dating that we can attempt to do using a, a Dominican fossil, um, these parasites have probably been around 100 million years. So I'm willing to wager that dinosaurs uh, of some sort probably did have hemosporidian parasites 
And then as we get, uh, you know, the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs, the, the hosts become exclusively avian here, eventually transitioning into other sauropsids and then mammals. What really jumps out though, is that not surprisingly, I would say, if you really think about it, it's vectors that drive the diversification of this group. So every time we see what roughly corresponds to the evolution, the diversification into a new genus, this is corresponding with a shift in the vector. So we have a vector maybe accidentally feeding on something that parasites manage to survive and replicate and then go through that bottleneck and then diversify um, in that new clade. But finally, and this is my technical term here, the taxonomy is really messed up, particularly with plasmodium. And, and you're gonna see this a few more times uh, as we continue on this journey. So we don't have much in terms of those nuclear genes. The other challenge that was going on is that, you know, we just showed that the vectors are important However, we don't know what the vectors are for a lot of these parasites. They've only been observed in vertebrate blood smears, and we don't know the corresponding uh, vector. So any of the traits that would be associated in the vector stage are completely lost to us. Um, so I'm not going to talk more about vector work, but the final point is that it's also been challenging because most of the, the specimens that we know of are a single or a handful of stained blood smears. And so again, I know I sound a little bit jealous here maybe, but I haven't had the opportunity to, to get loans from a museum. I mean, even with ancient or near ancient DNA techniques, we've been able to go back to type specimens and, and other things. That's just not been possible. The, the stain that we use on these blood smears makes it almost impossible to get any DNA out of them. Um, and so, that has meant new collecting or repeated collecting in order to get at that diversity. So I would say, you know, the bulk of my career, I've been balancing two things. One is continuing to add new taxa to the data set so that we're really getting a better picture across the group, as well as continuing to add more loci so that we have a greater and greater robustness for our tree. So I wanted to just share, I think this is, is sort of indicative of some of the serendipity that happens in science as well as personal relationships. So Julian Shar, Julian Shar um, was doing an internship at AMNH's Southwest Research Station uh, one summer. I happened to show up with my PhD student and an undergrad and Julian was really quiet, but at one point we were alone in the bunkhouse together she mentioned she had just returned from Africa where she'd been sampling bats. It turns out with a former colleague of mine from University of Vermont. And I started to talk to her very excitedly about malarial parasites. And so Leanne managed to do some additional field work. Um, so she had just been to Guinea. She did some expeditions in Liberia as well as in Cote d'Ivoire. And this has been an amazing partnership because we have discovered a huge diversity of hemosporidians infecting African bat hosts. Um, so looking at both the morphology of these parasites in the blood smears, as well as using molecular systematic techniques, we see four of the, the previously described genera in these samples. So now we have uh, multiple lineages of hemosporidians in these bats. Um, and so here's, here's the phylogeny based on a small set of genes at this stage. We had polypromophilus, nycteria, uh, a lot of hepatocystis parasites. And again, this was sort of this weird genus that had been part, um, or a phyletic part of mammalian plasmodium. But we were also so fascinated to see that the bat plasmodium species are actually intermingled with rodent malaria. So the phylogeny that we resolved shows that these parasites seem to have switched back and forth from rats to bats to rats. And that's truly fascinating because rodent malaria has been the primary model organism with which to study any number of facets of human malaria, be that chemotherapeutics, life cycles, vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. However, we have to remember that the natural host of rodent malaria is not 
the white laboratory mouse, the natural hosts are these arboreal thicket rats that are found not in cages in the lab, but in gallery forests in Western um, Central Africa. So if we step back to our results, this actually makes a lot of sense that you would have vectors looking for a warm body to take some blood from, and they may as well encounter a rat in a tree or a bat in a tree. And so over evolutionary time, it looks like these parasites have swapped back and forth. Um, so that was really interesting, again, because these, are, these have been the models, and yet bat malaria may have played an important role in the evolution of this clade. Another serendipitous thing happened to fall on my lap. So this is Ellen Martinson, who I had collaborated on that previous phylogeny that I shared with you. When Ellen finished at Vermont, she went on to a postdoc at the National Zoo where she was serving mosquitoes around the zoo and looking at the possible transfer of local avian malaria parasites to zoo birds, something that, that zookeepers all over the world really worry about. She sequenced malaria that she got from the mosquito blood meals, and one of them was very puzzling to her. Uh, she compared it to other bird malaria, it just didn't fit at all. She sent me her sequence and I put it into my larger taxonomic data set, and here's where it fell. So it was distant, but, but in the same clade as some of our bat malaria parasites. And so at first we were kind of amused. We thought, well, maybe this is a, a North American bat um, infected with a polychromophilus like parasite and this mosquito happened to feed on that. But then Ellen followed up and did blood meal analysis on that same mosquito and it was not at all a bat. It was a white-tailed deer. Uh, a few months later, via some necropsies at the zoo, they were able to observe this parasite. And I know this is a horrible pixelated picture. This is one of those, you know, cell phone held up to a microscope. But if you squint your eyes, it really is clear that what we had rediscovered was a taxon known as Plasmodium otocoilii, which had been described by PC Garnum himself um, in the early 80s from a splenectomized deer. Uh, and so here it was, it wasn't a, a fluke that just because that original deer had had its spleen removed. It, this was a parasite found in deer. So we wrote up our results, and then within a few months, two more studies of ungulate malaria parasites came out, um, both in, in Asia as well as in Africa. And so very quickly, we suddenly have a new resurgence of some samples in these bovids from Africa, including domestic goats and wild bovids, domestic and wild bovids from South and Southeast Asia, and then our white-tailed deer parasite. And then this is just one example of some of the other collaborations. This is Oscar Pineda, who was a uh, graduate student at Columbia, who was working on the conservation of these uh, Amazonian Podocnema turtles. We found them infected with what had been described as hemoproteus um, parasites. We obtained another hemoproteus sample from a spitting cobra. I'm glad I didn't have to take that sample, I will say. Uh, and through molecular methods, we realized that even though morphologically, the reptilian hemoproteus was similar to bird hemoproteus. These are actually two very distinct clades. And so we resurrected hemocystidium, uh, a previous genus that had been used for some of these parasites for the turtle, subgenus Simondii, and lizard. Uh, he subgenus hemocystidium parasites. I continued to do some field work, although not really recently, thanks to COVID, but I recently um, have been working in Indonesia, Sulawesi, as well as through uh, a student with Jim McGuire's who had sampled across the Lesser Sundas. Uh, this is made for some of the wettest, coldest, miserable field work I've ever imagined, but I've countered that with some of the hottest, driest field work uh, not far away in Australia. And so these are both places that are really super diverse in terms of herpetology. And not surprisingly, we're getting diverse parasites from those um, Indonesian, New Guinea, Australian hosts as well. What I think has been interesting, and I'm looking forward to, to continuing to collect data and analyze this, is that we're seeing a, a very clear signal that the host, the vertebrate host here is playing a role. So uh, we get clades, the gamut parasites, be they from uh, Oceania or Africa. So it appears that there's been a slow but continued radiation of these parasites as their host 
colonize uh, and diversify themselves. I wanna just take one brief tangent and talk about some rooting issues and then get to some of the most recent phylogenies. And that is, this is a cartoon of that original cytochrome B tree that I showed you. And just as a reminder, leukocytosis, we found that to be the root and there was a single invasion of these parasites into mammals. The other tree I showed you from Ellen um, and Joe and I had a similar uh, pattern. So at least birds were the, the more original host with a single invasion into mammals. A couple of years later, um, Diana Outlaw and Bob Rickliffs turned this on its head and proposed that basically we'd gotten everything wrong, uh, that leukocytosome was actually a much more recently derived parasite in this group and that there had been two invasions of mammals um, with polychromophilus, one of our bat taxa, <coughs> a more recent um, invasion. Drink. So if we're going to resolve this, we needed to have additional genes, more genes. So Janis Borner, as a, as a grad student, had begun to develop some loci using some other genomic data sets that were out there. And I was really fortunate to have him come spend uh, a year plus with me at the American Museum um, and working with my former student. So we basically did, you know, the wonder and past loci and our tax on sampling and collected a lot of data from these 21 different nuclear genes. When we originally construct, <coughs> me, construct the phylogeny, we actually produced something that's very similar to that last outlaw and Rickliffe's tree that I showed you, where we're seeing mammary, particularly plasmodium vivax, which I'm calling macaque plasmodium, that's its clade, at the root here, with polychromophilus um, much closer to our avian parasites. However, uh, given uh, the, the genomic composition, it's critical that we partition these data correctly. When we do that, we turn this on its head and we actually get something that is much more familiar in the sense that the avian parasites are, are the root of this tree. We get a single invasion of mammals, but for the first time we recovered uh, the bird and lizard, the seropsid plasmodium within that mammal clade. All of this discrepancy, as I alluded to, is because you see highly variable codon usage across this group. Plasmodium vivax and its relatives, the plasmodium macaque, as you see here, have they do not have, I guess I should say, that AT bias that is present in the rest of the clade. Um, AT uh, percentage in that clade is much closer to 50-50. And if you look at the figure on the right, you see that that macaque clade is much more similar in terms of codon usage, nucleotide composition to the outgroup, Tyleria. So it's very clear that this was an artifact where that, that codon usage pulled the plasmodium vivax clade toward the root of the tree um, and distorted those relationships. So this is the full tree that we recovered combining our taxon sampling and those 21 genes, very highly supported for, for most of this. And I just wanted to, to walk you through, this is the tree just condensed for you, a couple of the taxonomic issues we have. Again, plasmodium is a problem. Right, so if we take this, this clade as plasmodium, this is very unsatisfying. We have polychromophilus nested within this, nycteria, and hepatocystis. We could move it up one node and, and, and pull out polychromophilus, but we still got a very paraphyletic clade. So to be honest, what should be done is the separation of this into different genera. For the moment, we're recommending that we try to use uh, subgenera at least, so plasmodium in the seropsids as distinct, vincia, which is a known, or a, I guess a previously described subgenus, these are the rodent and bat parasites, plasmodium plasmodium, this contains the type species plasmodium malariae for the macaque, and then the clade that includes plasmodium falciparum would have a subgenus laverania. And of course, we backed off the true generic names because we would have to stop calling Plasmodium falciparum Plasmodium. It would be Laverania falciparum, 
no one's going to do that. I recognize that. Some of the other issues, of course, Plasmodium otocoilii, our dear parasite, not Plasmodium, maybe Polychromophilus. More likely, we should uh, elevate a genus for these new bovid or, or re renewed, renewed, <laughs> rediscovered, that's the word I want, um, bovid parasites. Uh, Plasmodium macaraceae, which was a parasite in Australian lizards, is really part of Hemocystidium. And this cool parasite that we found um, through some collaborators in turkey vultures was described morphologically as Hemoproteus cathartae. It's a very distinct there in that clade. What we really want with the whole world of molecular systematics, of course, is moving into is genomics. So getting as best we can. Here again, malaria has been problematic. We have a lot of issues. First, lizard and bird parasites, I mean, lizard and bird erythrocytes, blood cells are nucleated. So it's very challenging to separate parasite from host. Uh, parasitemias, that is the number of parasites within an infection is generally very low. So we don't have a lot of parasites. That means our host DNA is much greater than parasite DNA. We can't culture these parasites either in vitro, but even trying to get a lot of them from lizards or birds would take an enormous amount of blood to use some of the separation techniques. And as I said, we don't have vector stages for most of these. So essentially a situation on a needle in a haystack. For many years, I had people telling me, well, you know, just use brute force. There, there have to be enough parasite DNA in there that you can get something out, even if you just sequence everything. And so, as it turned out, there was a sale, a genome sale, at the local sequencing center, and we had a little extra money, and so we decided to just go for it. So we had a, a bird with a very heavy infection of leukocytozoan. We just did complete shotgun sequencing of this infection, and this is what happened. We got 400 million reads out of that. Uh, we filtered by GC content, which has been shown to be one of the most reliable ways to pull out hemospheridian. We all ran down to 3 million reads, then blasted those against a database of hemospheridians. And what we were left at the end of the day was a measly 5,000 out of our 400 million reads, or 0.00125% of our genome project. Because the parasite genome is relatively small, this was maybe, if you look at it this way, not too horrible, but clearly this is not the economical way to go about getting genomic data for these parasites. What we've turned to is RNA sequencing, our transcriptomics. This has been much more successful. Parasites are actively dividing, um, producing proteins, et cetera. And so the percentage of RNA reads, especially from blood, can be quite high. 20 to 40% of the reads uh, come from parasites. And so this is, you know, sort of the denouement at the moment. So using transcriptomic, new transcriptomic data that we collected, as well as some other data that were published, we're able to pull together 1,588 loci, almost 400,000 amino acids. Uh, and the, the, the orientation of this phylogeny is slightly different. But for those of you who've been paying attention, this is pretty much the cytochrome B tree. So after all of those data, we are, we are, we are getting sort of the same type of phylogeny with leucocytozoan as our root, mammalian parasites as a single origin, again with hepatocystis kind of snuck in the middle. All right, let me wrap up in just the last few minutes um, and tell you about some of the exciting new work that we're doing in the lab, and that is applying transcriptomics to try to get at key traits. So I've had the great privilege and luck to have been able to work on this amazing island of Seba, which is found in the northern Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean. It is just an absolute magical place. It's 13 square kilometers, a, a tiny little island. You can see the airway strip there. Most folks only know it if they're scuba divers. It has some of the best scuba diving in the Caribbean. But I've been going there for more than 20 years because it's also a lizard malaria hotspot. And this is my lab. This is a view from Flamboyant Cottage where I've been doing my work, uh, going around and collecting these adorable Anolis lizards, Anolis savannas, which are endemic uh, to Zeba. 
Anola Sabanis are host to three different malaria parasites, Plasmodium floridensi, as well as Plasmodium azurfilum and Leucocytica. These parasites are incredibly different though. Floridensi is what you would say is a traditional malaria parasite. It infects red blood cells and it makes that hemozoan malaria pigment. Plasmodium azurfilum infects red blood cells. You can see a schizon, it's doing erythrocytic schizogony. It doesn't make hemozoan, or at least it doesn't keep it if it does make it. And then even more strange is Plasmodium leucocytica is in white blood cells. It uses white blood cells as its host, and it also doesn't make hemozoan. Leucocytica and azurophyllum are sister taxa, so that's an interesting setup, but Plasmodium floridensi is much more distantly related from these parasites. So this is a really nice system where we've got three very different parasites infecting the same host, and so we're using this system to try to ask a series of questions. Um, so for example, do hosts express different genes themselves, immune genes, when they're infected by these different species? Do they express them differently if there's a mixed infection? What surface proteins, the proteins that the parasites would use to find their correct host cell, what are they expressing and what kind of variation is there? And then one of the things we're really interested in is the metabolic genes, particularly with hemoglobin degradation. So malaria parasites, this is a, a schematic of a mammalian parasite. They pull hemoglobin into their digestive vacuoles. They strip off the amino acids to create their own proteins. And what they're left with is heme, free radical iron, um, iron, which they must then package into that hemozoan pigment. So remember, we showed uh, this before, there's hemozoan pigment in the cell. This is been described as a for malaria parasites because so we look down at those quintessential in the metabolic pathway and stops that breakdown of hemoglobin into heme and hemozoan. And then both chloroquine and artemisinin themselves bind with heme and stop this key protein, heme detoxification protein, from forming hemozoan. Why is that effective? If the parasites cannot form hemozoan and, and convert that free radical iron into something that's inert, they have essentially poison themselves and so they, they won't survive. So Giannis uh, got to go down to Seba. We caught a bunch of anoles screen them in the field for infection, um, took some blood. I found that frozen corn makes a good to ice bucket when, when you don't have a lab right there. And when you use our human centrifuge to get our, our blood down. And then his family, Sarah Pengberg, um, who's a graduate student here at CUNY, has taken over this as her PhD project. And so she's continued the analysis of the, the transcriptome reads. And we, see, we do see very distinct clusters based on the expression of these genes across our three species. But she's really focusing in then on the genes involved in hemoglobin digestion. And at the moment, we have neat results, although it's a little bit confusing. So some of these genes do show a much uh, higher level expression in things that we might expect, like fluoridensi, plasmonium fluoridensi, which is in blue across the top, because we are getting hemozoan pigment. But we're also seeing that increased expression in our white blood cell parasite. And so it's a little bit of a puzzle um, to put together. This is a full summary of all of the genes that are known to be involved in hemoglobin degradation. And you can see that we're seeing expression of almost all of them in all three parasites. And of course, there's a lot of reasons for this. One is that these genes probably were ancestrally used just for all kinds of protein metabolism. Um, in lizard and bird cells, they have not just hemoglobin, but they have other proteins at their disposal um, to get their amino acids from. And also, I think there's just, I'll say, there's been a bias that, that the way things are done in falciparum is the way all of these parasites have done it. And I think these, these new data in non-human hosts are going to help us 
truly understand this pathway a little bit better and what, what the crux points are. So we'll continue uh, to work across this. Uh, just because things aren't expressed doesn't mean they're not in the genome. So we wanna follow this up now that we have um, some comparable data to do some probes or design primers and, and see if they exist in the genome. Sarah's uh, begun some selection analysis because it's possible that we're catching them in the act of, of devolving. So uh, even though they're expressing them, there might be relaxed selection on those genes if they're not uh, producing hemozoan. Uh, Sarah is going to be analyzing some transcriptome data that she's uh, just collected from recent fieldwork in Puerto Rico, where we have the same three parasites, but in a different host. And there's a number of other projects, some of which I alluded to before, like surface protein work and other types of comparative, comparative um, projects. So with that, I want to thank, this is just a small number of, of the many people that have been instrumental throughout my career, helping out in the lab, in the field, etc. I've been very lucky, lucky to have been funded through the museum, CUNY Graduate Center, National Science Foundation, the NIH, uh, the Australian work was funded by the Australian Research Council, and I will stop, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Susan. Thank you very much. That, that, that was, uh, yeah, I, I, I've managed to write down one, two, three, four, five unrelated words here, so <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether they're expressions of my ignorance or um, uh, uh, proper questions, and I realise as well something I don't know is how your applause and everyone else around here seems to know how you do it so I, i've got to i've got to find out how you do that but, but thank you very much um I, i'm gonna I, I do have some questions but i i, I want to if i, I want to open it up to any other person who uh, might want to ask a question whilst i find where that black <laughs> thing is over in the reactions you can oh yeah right all right too late now <laughs> it's okay <laughs> assume i've done it a quick, yeah, um, Adolfo, is that a question? Is that a hand? Up? That's not a clapping hand, is it? No, hi. I did clap earlier, but I also have I'm, a couple of questions. I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, Susan, um, great talk. Um, always a pleasure to hear you talk um, about your work. And so one question is, uh, do you think there would be any benefit in um, trying like single cell technology to obtain, perhaps obtain a bit more than you know the five thousand reads of the um, of the parasite, and then yeah. two. Nope. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then two. Um, as far as um, the you know recent news about the vaccine, uh, the malaria vaccine, and its you know uh, efficacy. What 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 do you think was a hurdle that will overcome for that? Because um, I know as we talked about before, um, parasites were always you know difficult to develop vaccine for. So I don't know if you have any insights as to what the hurdle was that they, they jumped over. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, metabolically um, or, you know, evolutionarily to develop the vaccine. Yeah. Um, so the first question about single cell genomics, you know, this has been circulating in the back of my mind for a while. And there have been a few similar related techniques. So at one point, um, Holly Lutz, uh, who some of you might know from microbiome world, uh, she was working on some malaria projects as well. So they tried laser dissection of parasites out of smears. Um, we, have, we have considered it. If we're talking about lizard and bird plasmodium or, or other, not just plasmodium, the other genera, we still have the problem that the host nucleus is there and that genome is many times larger, a couple orders of, well, little bit more than a, an order of magnitude larger. Um, so the only way to escape that would be another method that's been used, which is to capture the very brief point in time when the parasite is extracellular during its life cycle. So when it's picked up by the vector, the parasites come out of the blood cells as micro and macro gametes, and then fuse into the ookinete stage and it's that one brief free living if you will stage that then traverses to the insect's midgut and so 
there has been a little bit of success timing that exactly right, getting oocnetes, which are free from, relatively free from host DNA, and getting some genomic sequence. Um, so that's worked in at least one of the bird taxa. Um, cell sorting, maybe, but um, it hasn't been particularly straightforward because we do have these blended genomes. Um, with the vaccine, you know, one of the, the important caveats is that it's been exclusively developed for children. And so I need to, I need, I was reading part of the, the original paper, you know, following that rabbit hole, but my understanding is that it's, it's, it's protecting children based on the slightly different immune response that children have to the parasites versus adults. So this is not going to be a vaccine that, that we line up to get, at least right now, say if we were traveling or living as adults um, in malaria endemic regions. Uh, but one of the major hurdles is that most vaccines against pathogens, and that includes eukaryotic as well as bacterial, really hone in on the surface protein, just like we see with spike protein with COVID. And malaria can swap that surface protein very readily. It's, it's a variable um, gene family. And so it's been very <clears throat> hard to, to create a stable vaccine that would give protection against the myriad uh, surface proteins that these parasites could express. So, yeah. And they don't have nervous systems at all. <laughs> oh, that was my third question. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. Great to see you. Thank you. Pablo, that looks like a, a raised hand. Yeah, it's a raised hand. Uh, thank you, Susan. I really enjoyed your talk. <laughs> it, it was really good, really good. I have, I have a few questions, but I'm going to restrict myself to two, yeah, if that's okay. Uh, first one is that it's been very nice to see how knowledge has been accumulated over the years, but I couldn't stop thinking that you said you still know very little about the vectors. So I guess that also talks about the lack of studies in, in in other groups of organisms as well. Yeah. Has that has that lack of knowledge affected your studies and how? Oh yeah. And 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 to be fair, you know, I was I was giving you a, a you know a certain uh, pared down version, I guess. You know, there's a lot more work that's been done out there. There's tons of work across avian malaria parasites. Uh, and then some really exciting work has been coming out. I mean, it's been a little while, but I keep seeing it develop, which are the, the parasites in great apes. So if you remember the phylogeny of C. falciparum and Raikinawi, we now know that there are multiple species level taxa that are found in chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas. Um, and it looks like some of those may be flexible in terms of host, which is really, exciting on the systematic side of it and biogeographic side of it, but really challenging on the therapeutic side of it, because um, if there's any exchange there, you know, that's going to be problematic. The vector side, you know, this has been one of these things where it's just been incredibly hard to incriminate vectors. Um, you saw a little bit of, of Ellen's study, so using capturing mosquitoes and then looking at the, the parasites in them. I had a few slides in there and then I, I took it out just because it was getting a little long. I've done a tiny bit of that work with um, a woman who's just now a faculty member at Cornell University mm -hmm. here in upstate New York. So she surveyed black flies in Colorado, so you know, a very small geographic location we found 13 different lineages. And what was really exciting on the vector front is that it allowed us to sample parasites that we would never sample on the vertebrate side. So things that are likely in owls and other birds of prey, uh, water birds, and, and things that you know you don't typically miss net. Most of the avian malaria work mm -hmm. um, that's been done has been from birds that you can miss net, so passerines. So it just shows that there's there's even more diversity out there um, to be seen. So I think, I think to me though, and I hope I'm, I'm getting at the crux of your question, one of the most challenging things that, that had been going on, and I'll put it in the past tense, is that there wasn't great coordination between people working on these different, and it tends to be host specific mm -hmm. groups, 
and collaboration of data. And so uh, about um, dating myself, it's about 10 years or so ago, maybe even a little bit more, there was a group that was funded by National Science Foundation to form a research coordination network. And so it allowed the major drivers in <laughs> Lithuania, Sweden, um, and then folks from various parts of the US and other places in Europe to finally come together and really share these methods. And that's helped enormously, mm -hmm. I think, to, to collaborate and cooperate. Um, there's sort of, you know, <laughs> I, I'm looking at Joanna's picture and she and Spencer are, are really the only trainees I've ever had working on bird malaria because there are so many people who study it. It's, you know, I felt like I should let them do that. I'll focus on on lizards, which which is not as well studied. And of course, I could work, I could be in the field every day from now until mm -hmm. the day I die, and we'd still find more and more parasites, particularly in, you know, Australia has something like 900 species of herbs. Right? So there's lots there, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, another question, I hope that's okay. Uh, have there been any, any studies on divergence time estimates? Oh, yeah. Different general? Yeah, we actually, we attempted that in a couple of ways. And that, that was another thing that, that is on the cutting room floor, as they say. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> it's yet again, something that's really hard. We have <clears throat> one fossil, which is this uh, midge from Dominican Amber, so it's 100, 120 million years old. Um, that fossil, in that midge, you can see osis on the midgut, which mm -hmm. is a hemosporidian trait. So we can date the family back 100 million years. All of the other calibration points then have had to come either from external calibrations like in biogeography, so using islands or other land masses as a calibration point. And I think everyone here knows that that can be problematic um, because you can have different um, back and forth dispersal and other things that muck with that. Or host calibration points, um, and that can be problematic. We know these parasites do switch hosts fairly often, or at least many of them do. So the only other option for, for molecular dating then is molecular clock type hypotheses. Um, and so there was a study that used the initial genomes from the primate malaria, human and primate malarias and rodent malarias and did a smooth rate to get a rough um, molecular clock estimate. And so I took sort of that larger phylogeny um, of the other, of the diverse genera that you saw. And we tried to apply that rate to it. Um, all I can say is that it, the, the key things that to me seemed at least consistent and just, you know, I pat myself on the back or whatever, is that the divergence into mammals does happen right around 65 million years ago at the KT boundary. But there's quite a large, as you would imagine, given, given this data set, there's quite a large mm -hmm. um, confidence limit around that. So it's not wildly unpredicted, right? It, it seems that when mammals appeared on the scene, it likely didn't take long for blood feeding insects to discover them um, as food sources. And as they did that, in a few cases, obviously the diversity of mammal parasites is kind of wimpy, right? There's not a lot. Um, but in a few cases, those parasites took hold uh, in those in those mammals. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for your talk. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Thanks, um, uh, Elena. Your your hands up there, I think. Uh. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a really basic question with apologies because maybe maybe this is parasitology 101. Um, but I was wondering if you could say something a little bit more about the zoonotic shifts to zoonotic jumps. And um, you'd said br briefly that um, the, the um, jump to domesticated uh, fowl 
was at one point suggested to maybe go from humans to the birds um, and that that was improbable. And I was just thinking, well, wh why uh, didn't I, maybe I just didn't, didn't catch it. Um, but I had, I had that as a question. And then prompted, I have a second question prompted by um, your response to Pablo just now um, about the, the mammal jump. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, mammals were around uh, throughout the, the, the time of the dinosaurs. And in fact, there were mammal-like reptiles before mm -hmm. that, plenty of things of that sort. So I was sort of wondering if it was maybe a size thing and whether the, whether malaria in, in a big host, because it's mm. a big engine. Once you're in there, um, you get the whole body working for you to replicate and all of that extra surface area, although it doesn't scale, but you know, the surface area and, and all of that, that might make it, might make it a better place to actually, um, you know, do your, do your parasitic replication. Yeah, that's, those are interesting questions, Honor. Thank you. Um, in terms of the zoonotic spillover, I, I would say now that we have much improved taxon sampling, that has, that has much gone by the wayside with the exception of non-human primates. So what, what appears to emerge, and this is, it seems to be consistent, is that the parasites jumped at one point, you know, again, 65 million, give or take 20 million years, from birds into bats. Bats seem to be these key transition hosts. Um, I suspect that has a lot to do with ecology, just that ornithophilic vectors that are looking for me in a tree might find a bird or it might find a bat. Um, and I guess I forgot to mention, but specifically the bats that grouped with the rodent malaria parasites are tree roosting bats as opposed to cave or some other thing. So we don't see a lot of, we don't see any examples of zoonotic transfers except from non-human primates to humans. So many of you, if, if you learned in school, there, there were four species of human malaria and now you might've been surprised I said there were five and that's because Plasmodium nolisi, which used to be thought of as just found in macaques, actually is perfectly capable of infecting humans. To me, and maybe this is, is some of both of your answer, um, the vectors really are the drivers uh, and their preferences uh, for the hosts that they feed on have been critical in, in determining these, these jumps. And so both mosquitoes as well as black flies and other diptera um, show in many cases really strong preferences for one group. So, you know, soon after that, that picture of me drenched in, in the freezing rain, we were up at a, at a mountain in Sulawesi and I was getting black flies around me, but they weren't biting me. And I was the happiest person as a parasitologist because I said, oh, these are ornithophilic black flies. And if these are ornithophilic black flies, I bet there's leucocytozoan up here. And sure enough, we, we are finding a lot of leucocytozoan. Um, but, you know, you really hit on one of the things that has plagued me for my entire career, which is host switches are clearly rare because we see so many patterns. Um, and there's numerous studies, particularly in birds, where, uh, yeah, you see some generalist parasites, but there's always some pattern of host specificity, even on the vertebrate side. So they're rare, but they clearly happen. And so, yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, the thing that seems to sit with me best is that they are, they are fortunate, lucky mistakes of a vector biting the wrong thing and the parasite being able to take hold and then having that same vector come back and continue to transmit the parasite as it um, as they both, the parasite and the vector, now adapt to that new kind of host. In terms of the size, that's a really interesting point. Um, 
but I think I think there's just there is a lot of variation in terms of size. So we see we see malaria being very successful, malaria parasites being very successful in certain, you know, some small bodied mammals, rodents and bats, um, certainly small birds and lizards. But we also see you know, hepatocystis has been found in hippotamus. So um, yeah, I don't know that that the size has affected the the parasite so much, but that's an interesting idea. They certainly would have a lot to wrap. Great, thanks, Elena. Th 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 thank you, Sue. Yeah. <clears throat> You've been on the, 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 the spot there quite a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to let you off the hook. I'm sure these guys do it to me so that I don't get to ask uh, my own question. I, I am going to ask you though, because I'm going to leave you there just for one more minute, because I'm I would really interested in how those relationships are um, evolving in the sense of the relationship diagrams, the cladograms, the phylograms you have. Um, uh, uh, you, you you drew drew attention to it. I might not have noticed it, but you drew attention to it that uh, you're you're almost back to the cytochrome tree. Um, I'd be really, uh, you don't need to do the details, but I'd be really interested in how many nodes worth in the cytochrome tree are existing in the um, current version. And I'd also like to know, sorry, terrible question to ask you right at the end, but are, are, are we in danger generally about relationships? None of, the, none of the other stuff, but are we generally in danger of accumulating um, uh, lots of information but it's very limited. From mitochondrial genes, oh sorry, from mitochondrial genes tends to be quite quite good, um, but of course you know I, it's still worth doing. I think it's it's when it's not exactly concordant that that the most interesting things jump out at us. Um, some of which might be genomic oddities or whatnot. The data to knowledge, I don't know. I think I think that, and I hope I. I I somewhat got to that. The fact that if we can trust more, of course, nothing's known, but if we trust more the relationships and we continue to see them no matter what type of data we use, I think it does set us up to important questions with knowledge. It, I, it sets us up to get at some of the things that Eleanor was asking about zoonotic shifts. So when we when we really can trust those relationships a little bit more, um, I think that that we can unravel some of those patterns. And that that works maybe at the broader scale if we're thinking about host use and and really kind of ancient, if you will, biogeography. How did these parasites? Yeah. originate and come to be found all over the globe in these various hosts, as well as the cellular molecular aspects, the, the stuff that Sarah's working on now in terms of, of gene expression and metabolism, you know, things that, that have been taken as dogma because they've only been studied in the human parasite and maybe the rodent malaria model. We now we now can use systematics to set up questions to look at how and when those changes occurred. Um, so I think I think we will get at some good knowledge. It's not just uh, total information. So yeah, right. I'm, I, I am actually going to let you off the hook. This one reason. This is a great reason why I think it. You know, we, we, we'll we'll get you to London so we can continue these Absolutely, conversations. Yeah. Because two, there was two other words I had. There's a few other words I had written down, but there's two other words. One was was geography. I wanted to ask you about that, but we, we'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> the other the other word was a person. It was Mattingly. Uh, I was really yeah. interested in his diagram, but that's mosquitoes. So I'm, I'm gonna. I, I wondered how he he put that together. So uh, it, yeah. it doesn't matter now. Um, the reason 
why I put his name there was because, uh, slightly given away my age a bit, but I think I remember seeing a very old Mattingly, Matt, Mattingly moving around the museum when I first started there. So, uh, uh, goodness, so what, what a connection. Um, so I want to thank you very much for, for that talk. I wasn't sure how to um, summarise it, except um, I hope Will doesn't mind, but he's put something in the, the chat here, and I think I'm, I'm going to steal his words here. Um, he said <laughs> it was a, a really inspiring talk, but what he puts in there, it justifies working in organisms despite or even because they're difficult and therefore interesting to work. I think you've demonstrated that adequately, real world problems, um, a lot of stuff that's achieved in spite of what I might have implied, and a lot of things to do. So I'm grateful for you for, for doing this, um, and uh, we'll We'll do our best to try and get you to come to London and uh, absolutely, yeah, maybe even this spring. I'm I'm cooking up some plans. So the the, the well, least we can, the least we can do for you doing this is, is get you a drink from somewhere else. Oh, that would be awesome. We can, we can talk about Mattingly and, <laughs> and geography. So and, and I can probably thank you again. It's such an honor to have been selected to to do the Huxley lecture so uh, I'm really appreciative to, to you and the rest of the folks in the Systematics Association it's a real real honor to me and, and thank you. It's our that. pleasure and thanks for letting us record it and we'll stick it up there for other people. Um, just so everyone else grateful for you being here um, I'm never quite sure how to uh, close these things down on Zoom because when we're in the Lenan Society I just say let's go upstairs and have a glass of something so <laughs> You guys could all disappear off to your relative kitchens or wherever you <laughs> keep your supplies of wine, have a drink. And once again, Susan, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and yeah, I did find where the clap thing was. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Take care. <laughs>